Welcome to the 30-Minute Hour. It's the personal development podcast for the seven-figure entrepreneur who's looking to level up and become unstoppable. I'm your host, Eric Twiggs, your procrastination prevention partner. So my normal co-host, Ted Fells, the super CEO, will not be joining us today. He is attending a conference, and like we always say, when you're a super CEO, you go to conferences. That's just what you do. So we, we certainly wish Ted well um, at the conference he's attending. Wish him safe travels. But today we're going to talk about the secret to achieving freedom of time and money. It is possible, believe it or not, to be free financially and to have your time as well. We're going to talk about that because I know we've got entrepreneurs who follow us, um, but I, I hate to say this, Joe, but some of the entrepreneurs, they really own a job. That's it's true. A, it's a sad thing. They own <laughs> yeah, a job, but they own a job that they can't leave yeah. w- without dire consequences. So uh, we, we, we want to talk about, you know, how, how do you achieve the freedom of time and money? How do you get to the point where you're working on the business and not just in the business? Um, that's what we're going to talk about today. And we, we have the perfect person to really share insights and shed insights on this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce him right now. Uh, He is uh, an underground serial entrepreneur, investor, uh, outsourcing expert, father and husband. He owns four digital companies, five wedding venues, and a real estate and real estate investment properties. He's built multiple seven-figure companies and built a strong growing real estate portfolio uh, and get this all of his companies are fully being run by his virtual assistants. I remember when he, we talked a few weeks back, I'm like, we, we got to find out exactly how he's doing this. Um, so I, this is one of these episodes. I need to remember that I'm actually doing the interview and not listening to the podcast, but that's, <laughs> please join me in welcoming to the 30 minute hour joe rare thank you very much i appreciate you having me yeah man welcome welcome it's truly an honor uh to have you on the show today uh i am curious uh, i want to give everybody the backstory as far as how you got to this point so how did your how did your journey as an entrepreneur begin uh i you know through a lot of interviews, I've actually kind of uh, honed in a little deeper as to when it really, really began. Um, mm-hmm. One of the kind of the core times that uh, that I knew I needed to do something that wasn't what everybody else was doing was when I was, I think I was like nine years old. Um, my A friend of mine, his dad used to take us to Oakland A's baseball games and he would take us in the middle of the week. And it always was strange to me how, how can he do this consistently not work in the middle of the day when everybody else is working. And I always was like, I, I don't, what is it? And, you know, later I find out, I'm like, oh, he owns the biggest businesses in town. And we, we grew up in a small little farm town. And so, it, you know, but he owned the biggest businesses. And so it was really fascinating to, um, to learn this and understand what he was doing. And so then once I got into high school and um, I think I was kind of getting out of high school, um, I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That was kind of like a really good way to explain how really the the world of money works and being a business owner. And then you get into the cash flow quadrant and all those things. And so I love the lessons that are there. And it was really the rich dad poor dad thing when I'm like, oh my God, that's how Jim was. And that's what I'm going to do. And so I'm going to be a business owner, period, end of story. And that's how it's going to be. And it was, it was really as, as simple as that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So, like, my dad, I, I saw him, you know, going to work every day, getting up, yeah. going to work. That's, you know, so you think that that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, my, yeah. dad, had great, my dad had a great career in the federal government, did a great job, worked hard. Um, that's, you know, what, what you think of work as. And it really shifts your perspective when you see see someone that I can just do what they want. They have, right. where they own their time. We're most That's right. Yeah. Time exactly. for dollars. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. 
So now, I mean, would you say that you are just kind of a born entrepreneur? You had the lemonade stand. You were telling no, selling you shirts. Know, I, I did. I, you know, I we did. We had some lemonade stands as kids, but it wasn't. It wasn't that like die hard as a kid entrepreneur type um, thing. You know, I was. I thought I was going to be a professional baseball player, um, mm. and then after that, it became a professional whatever other athlete I was going to be. But I, you know, it wasn't. I never understood until then that I would be building businesses and that would be my focus in life until, you know, really until that, that moment of reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, realizing I won't be creating somebody else's wealth. I'll be creating my own and I'll do my yeah. own thing. Yeah. Got you. Okay. So, so if you think back to like when you first started out as an entrepreneur, you know, so like what, like knowing what you know now, like what advice would you give to that, that starter version of yourself? Be ready to fail be okay with failing and go make a whole bunch of mistakes. Um, there was an interview, actually, I, I forget who was on it with uh, Alex Hermosi, and it, it really rang true because I've had many businesses that haven't worked out. Um, I got lucky on a few early, lucky meaning that they just worked out really well. Um, timing, market, all those things kind of worked out. And I was pretty young at the time. But in the interview, Hermosi mentioned, he goes, my first nine businesses failed. Ooh. And if you think about it, it's wow. like, you know, you get into entrepreneurship and you think about, I'm giving up all the things that are normal to most people. And so everybody's kind of like, well, okay, you're doing something crazy. You're getting, you're not supposed to be doing that. And then when your business fails, I told you so. And his mm -hmm. point was, yeah, they're right until they're not. And so the, the ability to fail and go do it again and do it again and do it again, knowing that you're learning and you're going to suck at something early, you're going to get better at it. And eventually you're going to get good at it if you do it enough times. And so my advice to myself, to anybody who's, who's young is like, get ready, go fail, get the lessons under your belt. Those repetitions, they're going to get, you're going to get a lot better. And so then you'll create success because you just don't suck anymore. <laughs> <laughs> or you suck a little less so yeah, yeah, yeah you suck less and less that's right until the point that you're kind of good at it yeah that's it <laughs> that's funny so um i have had a mentor in toastmasters uh the speaking organization yeah, yep. and like at one point he he belonged to four toastmasters clubs at the same time uh, yeah. everybody's like why in the world are you doing that and he said look i want to quadruple my failure rate Ooh, I like that one. That's actually yeah. really good. Yeah. That's good. So he, yeah. So he just wanted to fail more and more. And he's a great speaker. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that had something to do with that. But I, but I am curious though. So what, like, what did you learn? So you had these initial businesses that just failed. Like, like, what was it that you learned that's helping you now? Oh, a lot of things. I mean, systems, um, understanding how systems, you know, you can have, uh, you can have a great product, you can have a great service. Um, if you don't have the systems to operate the actual business entity, you're gonna, you're gonna have challenges. Uh, you know, we had, um, the other thing too, is like talent, understanding talent within an organization and how, you know, talent is the, it, it is the lever to scale. Mm. So going from, let's say a business is just starting, they're getting to six figures, the lever from six figures to a million, that really is just kind of a sales function. And that's being able to do more sales, you know, in less time than you previously were. And that'll get you to the million. But from a million to 10 million, it really is humans. It's putting together the teams. The teams are what are going to build you and get you to the eight figures and beyond. And that's the, that was really hard because I had had in one of the failed businesses, I'd had 27 U.S. employees all sitting at desks, a whole bunch of expensive equipment, uh, computers and chairs, and they have to be ergonomic chairs, and they have to, like, desks have to be the right height, and there's all these things that come into play. And at the end of the day, that whole process and that whole system didn't succeed. Mm. And then I look back and go, yeah, but those people couldn't get us to where that we needed to be. And that was a huge, huge ticket. And so I go, oh, I got to remember that lesson for the next time I build a team. And then it was only a couple of years later, we were, we were cruising along and eclipsed the size of that business. And here we are. So, so is it like what to look for during the interviewing and hiring process? Is that kind of 
The well, it's a little bit of that, but it's just raw talent. Yeah. You know, it's, it's somebody's ability to execute, you know, they could be a terrible interviewer, but really good at mm-hmm. what they actually do. They just suck at interviewing and that's yeah. okay. So I always look at it as, uh, you wow. know, if you were to personality profile somebody and then you were to skill set profile somebody. So yeah. figuring out where they fit, their personality may not be great for anything client facing, anything communicative. That's okay. Does their skill set even require it? So quick example is you can get somebody who might be on your team to do social media marketing, or they might be doing client relations and customer service and things like that. They probably need to be more of like an interpersonal skill type where they can communicate well, they have all that versus a developer. A developer, you don't want them talking to clients, right? Don't let that guy talk to a client (laughs) because it's going to be awful, right? He's a terrible (laughs) communicator, but he's very technical and he's going to be very, very good at that. And so that the, those are the types of things is how do you find the right people for the right roles to do what you need done to get you to the next level. But at the same time, um, how do you do it without you involved in the business? And that's become my expertise. Yeah. So, so one of the things I've seen, and I like your input on this is that one of the things is that hurts the, uh, the entrepreneur. When you interview somebody, sometimes you, you like the person because that person is a lot like you. Yeah. So you you feel connected to them and you end up bringing them on. But the challenge is just because they're like you doesn't mean they're a fit for that role. That's right. That's right. And, and I mean, understanding uh, another thing too is understanding where somebody's goals align with where you can allow them to be in the business. Yes. If if their professional goals don't align with what you can provide in, in, in a position within your company, they shouldn't be there. And yeah. what the, the challenge is that you're going to find out the hard way if you don't recognize it early. For sure. For sure. Yeah, it's, it's like they say in sports. It's just, sometimes it's not about X's and O's. It's about Josh's and Joe's. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad because that's something just through the years, even like, you know, years ago I was a district manager. And I, one day I just woke up and realized that my success had everything to do with the quality of people I surrounded myself with. Absolutely. You're and as I got better this. people in these positions, yeah. my job got a lot easier. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the the right people can transform your personal life as well as your business life. For sure. For sure. So, so what, and what's something that you used to believe to be true about business that now when you look back, you're like, oh, that's not true at all? But that, oh, well, I mean, one, one area is that starting a business takes a lot of money. Um mm-hmm. You know, now I'm in kind of the game of, of starting projects like that. Um, you know, that, that was a huge one that it took a ton of money to start something. And if I were to look back, each of the businesses that I've kind of launched don't require much capital to begin. Yeah. Um, but yet you could scale them pretty fast. So that would be something that I think a lot of people are, are underestimating. You can do things with very little and you can move really quick with very little. Um, of course, resources improve speed and velocity um, and give you more opportunity, but it's not impossible. Mm. So that would be one, one major lesson that I've kind of figured out. Okay. All right. No, that's good stuff. I think it's always good to have like mentors. You know, mm-hmm. if, if you think of starting a business, you know, find there's, there's somebody who's already doing it and they could help you, help you to get to that understanding. You know? That's right. Cut the corner. Success leaves clues. So go right. do, do what's, you know, find somebody who's already done what you want and then model their successes. Right. Right. Absolutely. And that could be a, I mean, that, that's, I can just, my personal experience, just some mentors I've had have just cut down a lot of expensive mistakes and oh, even the thing you you know, think about it. If you say, oh, you know what? It's going to cost me all this money to start. They say, no, that's not no, true. No, that's right. Yeah. Here's what's really involved. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you, you use mentors that have done what you want, um, maybe even as narrow as the way you want to do mm-hmm. it. And all of a sudden, you don't have to butchwhack you know, your way through a forest. They've already done it. And you can just follow the, the path that they've already laid. Yeah, what's the, there's a proverb that says that if you want to know the path forward, find somebody who's on the way back. Ah, uh, there you go. I like yeah. I like that one. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, so that's that, that's the key. 
And I yep. think that really, but see, here, but here's the challenge though, right? Because we, we get in the business because we, we can make it happen and That's we don't right. need somebody holding our hand to do certain things. But I think that can be a crutch and a weakness as well. Yeah. A hundred percent. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. All right. So good stuff, man. This is a great conversation. I mean, we're yeah. talking about the secret to achieving freedom of time and money. So I know you mentioned, you know, being at the baseball game, but what else inspires you to focus on helping these business owners to achieve this freedom of time and money? Because most will never get it. Mm -hmm. And so realizing that most people start their businesses for freedom and whether it be, and freedom means a lot of different things to a lot of people, but let's, let's imagine most people wanted to be able to do everything they want to do when they want to do it. They want to be able to do their own thing, their own way without a boss telling them how to do it or something right. like that. They want to do it on their time, right? They're going to make their money and not make somebody else rich. All of those freedom ideas are fantastic. And most people start businesses with those in mind. The reality is most people never see it ever. Mm. And so, you know, they buy a new job. They, um, it, it's, it's, it's sad to think that that's what happens to most people. And, they put a ton of effort, blood, sweat, tears, sacrificing with their family to never at the end of the day, achieve what they set out to actually achieve, you know, in the, in the form that they believed it would come in. And so I have a unique opportunity in my, in my eyes to share a, a, a way for them to get there, strategy to get there. And it's really, it's, it's not easy, but it's not impossible. It's not so it's not so impossible that, that the average person can't do it. And I think that's the part that I like it, you know, and what I get to share is that anybody can do it. I'm not overly unique or special. I'm a college dropout. So there's a lot of smarter people than I am. If you have the grit, if you have the grind, if you can, um, you know, take, take lessons and learn and all that stuff, you can, you can have anything you want. Yeah. And, and I mean, I've had the, um, good fortune and privilege to be around a lot of top performing business owners and I've coached top performing business owners and none of the ones that I've worked with are in the weeds. Right. They're all right. working on their business. That's right. You know, quite a few of them could leave the country and come back and business is better. And that's, and that's a really good, you know, that's a really good point is that if you can leave your business and come better off than it was when you left, like you're set. And, and that's a business that number one, you could sell. And number two, that could sustain itself. Yes. And so, um, you know, going back to the idea of, of, you know, Robert Kiyosaki and the, the rich, uh, rich dad book series, the cash flow quadrant was so important in where I wanted to get to in life, getting into that I quadrant as an investor was all I was trying to focus on while I was building and rebuilding and failing and building and putting teams in place and, and trying to figure out the success model. It was how do I go from self-employed? I got this little thing that I'm doing and I'm doing most of it. How do you go from there and move to business owner down into investor? How do you get mm. there? Because the investor piece of it is the game. Yeah. That's where wealth is made. And so getting to the point where I get to be a strategic advisor to my business, a strategic advisor and an investor. So I create that 30,000 foot strategy. Here's where the company is going to go over the next 12 months. Here's the resources I'm willing to deploy and ensure that we get there. My team is there to execute. Go. I'll check back in in a month, right? I'll mm -hmm. check back in in a quarter and then wow. we'll see how things are going. We'll make adjustments and so forth. Okay. Oh, that's good stuff. So, who is your ideal client and, and talk about like how specifically you help them? So one of our biggest uh, niches that we serve is the agency world because mm -hmm. agencies have so much fulfillment. And so agencies, typically marketing agencies are, um, but really who our ideal client is, is a business owner that is very busy, that is trying to grow their business, but they are out of time. They just don't have the time to go execute and get it done. That's the ideal, perfect, perfect client. <coughs> they have to be willing to delegate. 
And that is a big problem in, in uh, entrepreneurship is people unwilling to let go of things. And so if somebody's willing to, um, you know, they're willing to delegate or at least learn how to delegate, we can help them get freedom. We can help them create a lot more freedom and grow their revenue, grow their profits all through using virtual assistants. And so then, you're and fine. Then, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, go for it. Now, I was going to say, so you're finding that the, the whole oh. delegation piece is a big hurdle for a lot of entrepreneurs. Of course, because who can do it better than me? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is the, that is the, well, that's not the entrepreneur saying that is the self-employed person saying mm -hmm. when somebody's self-employed, they get stuck in the, I can do it better than everybody else. And so why would I have somebody else do it if I can do it better? Yeah. Right. It's faster if I just do it myself. Mm -hmm. It's faster, except you can't create processes that eliminate you from the equation. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny because I, I actually used to say nobody does it like Eric. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I literally used to say that. Yeah. Uh, that's a problem. <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, you, you know, look, okay, let's say it this way. It's a problem if your goal is bigger than that. Yeah. If your goal is just like, I just want to do my thing and I want to be the one that fulfills services or I want to be the one that, you know, packages product or whatever that might be, or I do the sales. Awesome. More power to you to do your thing. If your mission is more than that, you want to grow a business, you want to scale a business, you want something, you know, to, to, you want to be able to get out of it. Um, you have to delegate, you have to get things off your plate. So you, I mean, you bring them in because I think the key is really clarity, right? And I always say to people, mm -hmm. clarity is a starting point of success and really just beginning with the end in mind. Sure. You know, um, yeah. Like I have a, I have a mentor who has started and sold eight businesses successfully. And one thing she said was every time she knew that was kind of her end goal, yeah. she had a vision of, so, so what, what advice do you have for the entrepreneur? Cause I see this is just a common struggle. Most lack that clarity when they get into a business, what, what steps can they take to improve that clarity or gain the clarity they need? As, as lame as it is, sit down and write it, write it out, get, so I love brain dumps. Um, I mean, I have, you know, notebooks like crazy. You say something, I write it down. I love brain dumps. I think get, get your, get it out, get it out. Sitting down and actually writing down, give me, give me five scenarios that you see as the end goal right? Like what are these big achievements that, that are going to be the end and then start to work backwards from there and realize, okay, well, which ones are the most important? Why get into the why, why is it important to you? Why is that end you know, result super, super important? What is it about that? Right. Get into some of those things. And I think that as people do, and as you, as you start to dissect those down a little bit further and a little bit further, I think that's when you get, um, you know, you can start to gain some perspective and you can start to understand what it is that you've got in front of you and then where you're trying to take it. Because if you have that, if you have that end piece, it's so much easier to, you know, direct the ship when you know where you're trying to go. What's your North star? It's really easy to direct the ship when you know where you're going. And so exactly. to me, that's a big deal is figuring that out. Yeah. And I've just found it, it, it help, it's helpful for people to understand the need to get out of the weeds when they. That's right. Right. When you say, look, okay, you want to be here. Is what you're doing getting you there, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so definitely. I think that's where a mentor, again, can be helpful, a coach. Um, but really, I think the critical thing, or, I mean, you need to reach out to Joe. I think yeah, there me. we go. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Joe, you, you, you have to tell me that this whole virtual assistant model that you have, your, yeah. your company is literally run by virtual assistants. How did you get to that point? Four of them are. So, yeah. yeah. How did I get there? Um, well, let's see. So, you know, I had a bunch of businesses that failed, got into real estate uh, when I was in my mid-20s, failed. Um tons of things. And I was like, I was kind of at rock bottom. What am I going to do? And I decided, you know, I, I need some inspiration. And so a, a buddy handed me the book for our work week. And that was my introduction to virtual Tim assistants. Ferris. Yeah, correct. And that was my introduction to virtual assistants. I'd never even heard of one. I didn't know what it was. And then um, he referenced the world is flat, which is a book about 
you know, just about the internet being able to connect all people super easy. We can all reach each other due to the fact that, you know, um, it's now not complicated to get in touch with somebody in, in India or in Pakistan or, you know, wherever. So I read those books and then I said, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to build, I'm going to build a business exactly like Tim Ferriss says in the book. And so I sat down and I built one page by page, literally sat down and went page by page, do this, do this, done, do this, do this, done. And part of it was getting a virtual assistant. And so I did, um, got in, I hired my first virtual assistant in November of 2008 and I've had a team working with me every day since. And so that was how it started. And then, uh, I had an agency and I was working with virtual assistants internally and clients just kept asking, how do you, how do you find them? How do you hire them? How do you, and they used to just tell people like, Hey, go do this, go try this. And finally, one of my VAs came to me and just said, Hey, you know, you tell a lot of people, what if you just provided the service? And I'm like, nah, I don't really want to be a VA company. Like, I don't want to do that. And she said, well, what if we run it for you? And I'm like, all right. And so we started doing that for just our existing clients. And then once our existing clients um, were kind of just, it was just up and running and humming and doing all those things. And I was like, man, this is pretty easy. Well, then my other agency failed and that business. And that was the one with all the people in the office space and all that stuff. And that business failed. And I went and I said, okay, I'm going to relaunch my agency. I'm going to do it different. I'm only going to use virtual assistants, no local staff. And this is what I'm going to do. And so we relaunched the business, super fast uh, growth, super fast success. And that model, I'm like, oh my God, this is it. This is the model. And I said, well, why don't I just do that with these clients that I have over here in this little virtual assistant business? Why don't I just do it with that? And then that just skyrocketed the business. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, I figured it out. Like I cracked the code. I found the process that works to go from zero to, you know, whether it be six figures a month or whatever. And um, so then we did it with multiple other businesses. Hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, it is interesting because I, I have virtual assistants and yeah. I do get people who ask me all the time, hey, where do you find your virtual assistant? How do I find one? That, that sounds yeah. like a great idea. So no, that's um, I could see how that could be a good uh, a good business. Definitely. Um, well, good. So, talk to us about your your most memorable client success story. Somebody that maybe they were stuck in the weeds. That you started working with them. Now they're doing great. I mean, I a very common success story is clients coming where their business is kind of flatlined and they just don't they don't know where to go. They don't know um, who to hire. And one of the things that we're really good at is the consultative approach to working with clients. And so instead of just doing like, you know, Hey, a discovery call is technically a sales call, right? And you're going to get on the phone. They're going to talk to you, get your, get your needs assessment. And then they're just going to pound you and, and try to sell you. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a similar model, but what we don't do is we don't do like the pound sale. And what we do is very consultative and, mm -hmm. It's what's been great is the ability to really assess somebody's needs for where they are in their business, not just what they need as a service, but where are they in their business and what's the playbook to go from here to here, um, depending on their assessed goals. Like what are they trying to accomplish? And we have a client who won't drop his name just cause he's not that kind of guy. Um, he hired one virtual assistant. He, had no idea how to manage the VA, had no idea how to train the VA. And so he completely failed and it was really frustrating for the VA. So they ended up saying, Hey, I can't work with this guy because he's a train wreck. So we get back with him and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And the bottom line is he's a terrible communicator, <laughs> which is mm. the reason I'm not going to say his name, but anyway, he's a terrible communicator. And that was something we just coached him up on. Here's how, here's the best way to communicate with the VA. Here's the best way to communicate with the team. And so he started practicing all these things and the turnaround with just that one virtual assistant was incredible. And then this became his right hand gal. And from there, they've grown a team of 10 and his company went from failing to they do almost a million dollars a month right now. And he only runs that company using virtual assistants and himself. And that's it. And so, wow. and it was simple. And, and the key 
And we talk, he and I talk about this all the time. The key has been communication. It's been his ability to learn how to communicate effectively with his team, which is something that we focus on heavily because these people are around the other side of the world. And so since they're in a different country, different time zone, you know, their first language is going to be something that's different than yours. Your effectiveness with communication is the thing that's going to create success for you. And skill sets easy, right? Anybody can learn anything, but the ability to communicate, set expectations, really, you know, um, share with somebody what your core values are, how they fit into your company. It's unbelievably important. So that's one that's been very, very successful that, um, yeah, I love to tell about. Yeah, you know, and you bring up something interesting because I, I, I found it a challenge. You know, I have, like I said, I have virtual assistants. Uh, it took me a while to kind of get the right communication rhythm yeah. with, with my assistant. I think we've got a good thing going right now. Um, what, what advice do you have for the person who has a virtual assistant? What what should they be doing to be effective as far as communicating with their virtual assistant? Well, one of the easiest things that's, that you can do is when you're trying to get anybody to understand anything is understand that people have different communication modalities, hmm. right? So the way that they consume information is going to be different than how somebody else might. So things like some people are kinesthetic, right? Hmm. They need to actually practice things. They need to do things. Right. In order to in order to have success, other people are auditory. That's how I am. Right. I just want to listen to everything. Um, I don't need to see. I don't necessarily need to do. I just need to hear it, and that's why I listen to audiobooks so much. Um, you know, other people uh, are visual. Right. They need to see video. They need to see images, graphs, all that kind of stuff. And then some people are auditory digital, which is going to be they want to listen, they want to read and consume, and they want to analyze. <clears throat> Then they'll go take action. So who do you have in front of you? Well, if you're dealing with multiple people, it could be very different. So what we do is we always communicate content in video format with transcribed <laughs> content as well, right? And then we use a model called play, pause, do. So if you're teaching somebody to do something, you have a video, you're teaching them how to do the thing, you're showing them exactly what it is, and you say, hey, play the video. They're playing the video. Great. Here's what I'm teaching you. Great. I want you to pause the video. I want you to go do what I just said. And then I want you to come back and play the video again. And so they play, they pause it, they go do the thing. They come back and play the video, pause the video, come back and do it. And, um, and that works unbelievably well. Yeah, that, that's good. And, um, like, so there's a book I read years ago on situational leadership from Ken Blanchard. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, that helps too. If you understand kind of, okay, some people, they need more structure and more handholding and more follow-up. A hundred percent. Yeah. Then there's some people you just kind of throw it out there and they, they get it. Yeah. And it, you, you'll drive that person crazy if you give them a bunch of handholding. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And so we like the, the idea of giving it, giving people autonomy, do uh -huh. things on your own, but we're, but we're there in video format. Yeah. So that's helpful. Good. No, I'm glad we're talking about this because there's not a lot of information on. Okay, what's the? How do you? How are you? How do you become effective at? You know, managing your virtual assistant. That person's halfway around the world. Yeah. And then it becomes a challenge when it's a different time zone. Yes. And so you know, we right. do, but we do. We have everybody work our time zone. So okay. or or our clients' time zone, depending on how that goes. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Yeah. Now I'm sure you get like you get asked a lot of questions. Yeah, you know about how to improve the business, how to this. How to, what's one question you never get asked that you wish people would ask you? Man, I switch up my answer. I get I get asked this a little bit, and I kind of switch up my answer. Um, you know, lately you see online a lot of people saying, "If I lost it all, I would do it this way," right? Um, I like the idea of. Being where I am today, so you know, we have multiple companies doing over eight figures, like like we have success, we have a model. What's the model? <laughs> Nobody asks Joe, what's the model? Like, mm -hmm. how is it that we just literally recreate what you've already done? How do we do that? Mm -hmm. Zero people ask me that question. What they want to know is they want a story of how I got there. They want to know, uh, here, give me the these bits of and pieces uh, of this, but 
we have a model that we've built. Well, we technically we've built six companies using this exact model, exited a couple of them. But today, right now, there's four companies that are completely operated by virtual assistants that I don't touch. Hmm. And they spit off significant income. And it's this very specific model. And nobody understands how to do it, even though in my eyes, it's a simple because I'm a super simple kind of guy. I don't like complexity. Uh, businesses, as they grow, they get more complex. So you might as well be simple in the beginning. Um, so the models are based, are, are supposed to be simple. There's very simple bookkeeping. There's very simple HR. There's very simple, you know, financial management and marketing and all those things. All those pieces are very, very simple. And when they're replicable, you can just do it over and over and over again. And so for me, it's like, I just get to look for opportunities to deploy the, the system. And we know for a fact that if we pick the right market, we pick the right service or product, and we drop this model into it, it will be successful in a certain period of time. So for example, a year and a half ago, we started a business um, space I knew nothing about, decided to drop this model into it. And it only took us 90 days to hit hundred grand a month. Wow. And then I exited that business in five months. Hmm. Totally hands off, don't have anything to do with it. So if you had to really describe the model, how would you describe the model? The, the, well, the description of the model is you start out, I mean, I can get, I can get really deep in it. We won't do, cause that's like in a training in itself. But the, but the quickest version is, is if you have an idea, you're starting something new, uh, you turn, you, you start off by saying, Hey, listen, I've got this idea, go sell it. I, it's an idea, right? You don't have fulfillment. You don't have a service to provide. You don't have it. Sell it first, go get somebody to tell you yes, to verify that it's actually a good idea. So I'm a huge believer in, you know, fire. <laughs> what, what do they say? What is it? Fire. Ready, aim. Fire, aim. Yeah. Ready, fire. Aim. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. One. I live my life pretty much. Yeah. And so <laughs> What I mean, the way I look at it is go, we'll figure out how to fulfill something if we had a reason to fulfill it. The problem is you could spin your wheels with all these bits and pieces. What we do is we go, great, let's go sell it and then let's go build it. And so we sell first, build second, model the build to a team of fulfillment people. The sales piece of it, whatever we just did to find people to buy it, we model that and have a VA become the, the mechanism to go get new clients. The fulfillment team becomes the fulfillment based on what we just did. So we have those people in place. As that grows and you get a few people, you need somebody to manage those people. So now you put in operations, a director. Then as you have more people, you need HR, you need finance management. And it's, and it's, pretty, it's pretty simple to put these people in place, but you do it systematically as you need to. You start off with sales, you go to fulfillment, you go to operations, you go to HR, kind of HR and finance happen at the same time. And then you basically have a backend system that can be identical across all these companies. So meaning you use the same software, right? We use the same project management software across all companies. We use the same CRM marketing tools. We use the same methodology in marketing. We use the same ad strategies in all the companies. All of those things are identical across any company. And so, that, I mean, that's a, a quick, like, dirty, you know, explanation of kind of how we do it. Um, it's just most people won't take the action to go try it, to go try first. And so, I mean, we can get into all the nuances of each of those things I just said, but um, it's really just not overly complex, I guess is what I'd say. Yeah, I, I, just, I just believe simplicity is the key. It is. If it's simple for people. They're more likely to execute. Yes. Um, I, you know, I, I like things to be intuitive. Like if it's a mm -hmm. site, if it's a, it should be some to the, to the point where you can kind of figure it out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's a good way <laughs> to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like it that, um, I, <laughs> I always say it this way, if I can hand it off to a VA, I'm in good shape. Yeah. There you go. Right. I can hand it off to a VA. I'm in good shape. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. And so I take it, you help people to set up their model. Yeah. You know, we do, uh, that's more on a coaching standpoint. I take a few coaching clients a year. I don't take a lot. Um, the VA side of it, the VA services that we provide, we provide people to, you know, um, uh, get dedicated virtual assistants. So somebody to work inside their business, or they can do project-based work where they can buy a block of hours and just say, Hey, I've got 
graphic design work, video editing, content development, um, website updates. I have all these things that I need done in my business, but I just can't do it. I'm not doing it. I don't have the staff to do it. They can assign all those projects at one time. We just deduct it from the hours that, that are used. And then those hours roll over if they don't use them or when they are used, then we re-up and, and keep going. So it's a, it's like Upwork, but way better because we've done all these projects in our internal staff thousands yeah. of times. And so we do that side. And then with coaching, then I actually teach people my exact business model. We help them with bookkeeping. We, we, we get all the way down to the nitty gritty. Hey, here's our entity structures and here's our accounting structures and all that stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, good stuff. Now, so we're at the, uh, the the final part of the show. We call it "Write This Down," and this is where we'll we'll both go around and we'll leave our listeners and viewers with at least one idea from today's episode that they need to write down so they can level up. You know that what's that one takeaway? If you have more, yeah, certainly you can leave more. So, so, so Joe, you're the guest of honor. What do the people need to write down? Um, I would say fail fast. So you want to grow your business. You need to try a lot of stuff. Yep. You need to go out. You need to go make mistakes. Now that carries over to your team and giving people the autonomy and the freedom to go make mistakes. Obviously a mistake that's detrimental to the company isn't something that's tolerated, but giving people the latitude to go make a mistake and not get burned for it Mm -hmm. is unbelievably important. It's just like raising children. Children gain their, their strength and their emotional, you know, confidence and, and, and all that through making mistakes and fixing, fixing them. Like they have to go out and try things and your, your, your staff has to do the same thing. So we give a lot of autonomy to all of our team, go make a mistake. Now don't make the same mistake twice. That's kind of stupid. But go make mistakes and try something because if we're not failing, we're not pushing the envelope. We're not doing anything innovative. We're not doing anything new. So there's no room for safety. We've got to pl- we've got to play big, and you've got to go make attempts at at you know unique things and crazy ideas and stuff like that. Go make the mistake. Go fail. Don't burn the company down, but go make a mistake. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that, that we can recover from and then we're all going to grow from it. So that would be my thing to write down. Fail fast. No, yeah. I, I to- totally agree with that. That's how you get better. That's how you grow. But like you said, you know, get, get to the point where you're not making the same mistake twice. That's right. Good. No, that's great. Write that down. All right. <laughs> so, so my takeaway for today, I'm going to write this down is talent is the lever to the scale when you said that earlier yeah you know and it it goes back to even i was reading with a good to great and he's got and he and he says this thing like whenever you're like you're taking over a new enterprise it's it's first who then what yeah you know you really have to look at the people and he he uses that metaphor of the bus you know you you know you got to get the wrong people off the bus you got to get the right people on the bus and then when you get the right people on the bus you have to make sure the right people are in the right seats yes uh, yeah i mean i think that's it that, yeah that's there's, it. A, there's a good book called um who not how yes i know about and that so yes. who uh almost every single challenge that you can come across the answer to it is who right they have the how but like yes. i don't know how to do everything and so who will be the prob- person to solve that. And, you know, maybe it is going to be you at times, but, you know, if, if you want to scale, it's got to be somebody else. Yeah. And it's funny because I've, I've had this conversation with business owners a lot where I said, look, I know it looks like you have a lot of issues. You have a lot of problems, but you don't really. You have yeah. one problem. You have a who problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. For almost everything. Yeah. You're yeah right. You have a who problem. That's it. Yeah. I always like so. to say, so on a, on a similar standpoint, I, I always like to tell people cash, you know, financial resources solves most problems in business because the problem is actually who it's that person yep. and the access to having that right person in the right seat, doing the right things is being able to afford to buy one, right? Yes. How do you, how do you buy that person into your company? And absolutely. So, yeah. So the cash is the answer uh, to almost every problem in a business. Yep. Great point. All right. So thank you, 
Joe Rare for sharing everything that you shared. Uh, what's the best people, best way that people can connect with you? Get more information. Yeah, level number nine virtual.com. So level nine virtual.com. Um, I my email is Joe at level nine virtual.com. And uh, you got any questions that or in the top right corner of every page of the site is a book a call and you can chat with my team and again, consultative approach to how we bring clients on. Our our idea is to support you where you are to get you to where you want to go, not so much try to put you into a service that's best for us, because in the end, that doesn't work out. Um, so we've been very, very successful with our consultative approach to supporting businesses. Great. Okay. Well, Joe, once again, thank you. For you got it. Sharing everything that you share. This is one of those episodes I'm going to have to, when I'm working out, I'm going to go back and listen to it again. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's the, especially the things you talked about as far as communicating with your virtual assistant. Yeah. I don't hear that a lot in other, on other podcasts and everything else. That, that's great information. Um, so we've covered the secret to achieving freedom of time and money. Um, so hopefully for those of you listening and watching, don't forget to share the show. Make sure you share the show. Don't keep this information a secret. Don't keep this all to yourself. Make it Share this to someone that you know is going to benefit from this information. And also don't forget, you can listen to the 30 Minute Hour podcast on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, and any of those other podcasting platforms. So that is our time this week on the 30-minute hour. Thank you again to Joe Rare. And until next time, have a great one.